Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books Network. I'm your host, Schneer Zalman Newfield. In his book, Anonymous, The Performance of Hidden Identities, published by University of Chicago Press in 2023, Thomas DeGloma investigates contemporary and historical cases to build a sociological theory that accounts for the many faces of anonymity. Thomas DeGloma is an associate professor of sociology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm so glad his new book has brought him to our program. Welcome. Thank you, Zalman, for having me. I'm uh, really happy to be talking with you today about the book. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, So to get started, could you please tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to write this work? Sure. I am a sociologist. Uh, My general areas of sociological research fall within cultural sociology, very broadly speaking, and the field of symbolic interactionism. And I'm particularly interested in the ways that cultural forces shape experiences that are seemingly very personal Um, but in fact are broadly cultural, or at least of broad cultural and often historical relevance. Um, So I've always been interested in the intersections of culture and the self, culture and social psychology, culture and face-to-face human interaction, and a variety of related issues like trauma, personal discovery, and in this case, anonymity, that are linked in a lot of ways to psychology and social psychology, but I, I analyze them very much in a framework of cultural sociology. I'm interested in the ways that groups from very small groups to very large groups like nations and religions shape personal experiences and interpersonal behavior. So, you know, that is, you know, <clears throat> very much where my, my research lies. And I can honestly say I never really thought that out. I never really said, hey, I'm going to go into this. I never really, I never really sat down and said, "This is my area of study." But it, it just so happened that um, all of the things that I became interested in um, fell fell in that you know sort of general range of phenomena and and of experiences. Um, and this project in particular, actually, there's a there's an interesting backstory to it. It started as a paper in graduate school, my first semester in graduate school at Rutgers University, when I was taking a classical sociological theory course with Eviatar Zerubavel, who is, you know, a pioneer and a founding figure in a cultural sociology of cognition, but also somebody who really kind of keeps the Zemillion method alive, that method of studying broadly relevant social forms and patterns that transcend otherwise very different cases across time and context. And uh, he was a a, a huge influence on my work. Uh, And of course, his his graduate mentor was was Irving Goffman, the very famous contemporary theorist, uh, sociologist of the 20th century. And you'll see quite clearly uh, both of their influences directly in my work. So that's my sort of intellectual lineage. I was sort of trained in that tradition. But when I when I entered graduate school, I entered as a, a deeply committed Marxist and uh, and a political organizer. And so, you know, this first semester in graduate school, I was struggling with and learning a lot of new ideas while also politically motivated and interested. Um, and and Eviatar, you know, challenged us to. To you know, and I think in order to to both teach us sociological thinking, but also to to force us out of our boxes, out of the out of our comfort, our intellectual comfort zones, he challenged us to write a series of papers in in our classical theory course, and each paper was supposed to be adopting the theoretical lens of a particular theorist, and and you know these were short little essays, experimental essays. Um, and they could be on whatever topic we chose. And, and for the assignment that was related to the theory of Zimmel, I chose the topic of anonymity, which, of course, Zimmel addresses a little bit and others like 
Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman and, of course, Alfred Schutz have addressed the concept of anonymity in their work. But I, I saw that there was room for a much broader and a much more thorough and cultural sociology of anonymity. And so I took, you know, the, the sort of, you know, reins from them and or, or you know, got the baton from them and <clears throat> was experimenting by writing an essay about anonymity. And I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed the all of the room I saw for development there and all the ideas I had, which many of which were politically motivated at the time. Uh, and then that little paid paper, uh, that little paper was maybe, I think, 12 or 14 pages long. And it went into a filing cabinet for over 20 years. Um, and then at some point when I was thinking about my second book after I had published Seeing the Light and that was out for a while and I had finished writing a couple of articles that I had planned, I was like, you know, I really want to, you know, start a second book. And, and, and I took out that – literally took out the hard copy of the paper. I didn't even have a computer file. I didn't even have a saved computer file, computer copy. And I, I reread the paper and I said – I knew immediately. I knew immediately that there could be a book there. I knew immediately what I wanted the chapters to be focused on. And of course that changed a bit, but, but the seeds were all there in that early paper. And I, I started researching, I started, I started the process. So, you know, a lot of my interest in anonymity stemmed from some of the cases themselves, but from a lot of the, you know, deeper issues having to do with the moral and political significance of what it means to hide one's personal identity, to duck personal accountability, to create situations in which one is acting but obscuring one's personal identity in the process, and how that affects people, how that affects or shapes social interactions, how it shapes the meanings of those interactions. A lot of that was there in embryonic form from the get-go, but once I started to think about it as a more mature scholar, I saw that it was even richer than I imagined earlier in my career, and the cultural aspect of it was just, especially the cultural aspect of it that relates to the questions of how people perform anonymity and pseudonymity, how they, how this is a process of creating meaning in the world. Um, that just ended up fascinating me, and it and it provided me with enough intellectual inspiration to you know really uh, create this whole book. So that's the, the I guess the long winded story of the birth of this book. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that juicy background. Uh, I I really appreciate that, and especially I'm always interested in um, you know the question of how scholars come up with their ideas. I mean, you know, we, as scholars, you read other people's work and you tend to see it in kind of the polished, fully formed uh, form, you know, either as an article or as a book. And I think it's so interesting that you reach back to a, a short paper, you worked on it in their first year in graduate school, 20 years later and said, hey, let's let's dust that dust that off and and really um you know uh plunge into it and and see how that uh those ideas could be expanded so that's really fascinating um so let's jump into your book um uh let's see uh to begin with um you start off your book with a discussion of dr h anonymous who was he and why did he choose to remain anonymous at the 1972 annual meeting of the american psychiatric association sure this is a fascinating case and um you know it it, it was in many ways a great case to start the book off because it has it illustrates a lot of the different dimensions that I sort of bracket off in different chapters. But the case is fascinating because, um, as many people know, many may not know, um, that homosexuality was deemed a mental disorder by the American Psychiatric Association for for quite some time, for the for the better part of the twentieth century. And um, this is, you know, has huge consequences. Um, it uh, ended up, you know, by by deeming homosexuality to be a mental disorder, the American Psychiatric Association was not only uh, defining homosexual attractions to be pathological, to be an illness, to be a sickness that ought to be cured, 
but they were providing under the guise of science in the language of science, um, in the language of, of, you know, the psychiatric uh, language used by the American medical professions and adopted by insurance companies and used by employers and, and various organizations as the sort of default uh legitimacy uh, to determine the border between health and illness, they were providing uh, fodder for discrimination. They were providing a basis that organizations and institutions could use to discriminate against homosexuals or anyone that didn't conform with the heteronormative vision of what sexuality and gender ought to be. <clears throat> and so at that time, uh, in the in the early in the late 1960s and early 1970s, you also had, uh, you know, the the rise of an incredibly vibrant and powerful gay rights and gay liberation movement, and these activists, some of these activists, started to pressure the American Psychiatric Association to uh, uh, retract that definition, to to recognize that that homosexuality was not a mental disorder that was a legitimate form of sexual expression and to recognize that it was contributing to harm uh, with its definition of, of homosexuality um, as a mental disorder. And in the process of making that case, um, several gay rights activists, um, you know, including several, you know, a few that I discuss at the book, had had encouraged and, and, and really pressured the the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, to to uh, host a panel at its 1972 convention. Um, it was called Homosexual uh, uh, um, American Psychiatry Friend or Foe to the Homosexual, in which they sort of publicly would debate the, the uh, legitimacy of, of, of uh, including homosexuality in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And at this panel, you know, they had gay rights activists and established psychiatrists on the panel, but only one person could they convince, only one person to, who, was at, who was both a psychiatrist and homosexual to uh, be on the panel, but that individual who we now know as Dr. John Ursel Fryer, and we did not know that until decades later, but that individual, Dr. Fryer, at the time only agreed to attend and speak on the panel if he could be anonymous. So, you know, at the time, he was an untenured assistant professor of psychiatry at Temple University. He was very well aware that if he was known to be homosexual, a gay man, he could be denied tenure. He could be discriminated against in the whole profession. He could be deemed unfit to practice medicine, to practice psychiatry. He could ruin his career. Uh, the, the discrimination could have ended his career at the time. So it was a very brave act on his part, but to protect himself from that fallout, he uh, wore a large costume. Um, you know, one of the core arguments of my book is that we need to look at and analyze anonymity and pseudonymity as performative because it's not just about hiding. It's also about being in the world and performing with what I call a cover representation, some something that covers or stands in the place of personal identity to signify meaning without signifying that person, right? So he wore this costume as his cover representation, and it was very performative. In fact, his partner at the time was in the field of theater. And they actually took this oversized tuxedo suit that he was wearing from the props department, from the costume department of the theater where his partner worked. So it was in fact a theatrical performative costume. And he had this weird looking Richard Nixon mask that they had stretched out perhaps to fit him or perhaps just because they didn't want it to look like Nixon. But by the time he wore it, it no longer looked like Nixon. It was this stretch it looked kind of weird, you know, and just kind of nondescript, almost totally anonymous. And he wore a wig. <clears throat> he used a microphone that was uh, hooked up to a vocal distortion device. And he appeared on this panel with a placard in front of him that said, Dr. H. Anonymous. And he presented his statement speaking on behalf of psychiatrists who were homosexual. And he claimed that he was speaking on behalf of a number of uh, psychiatrists who were homosexual. And in fact, at the time, we know now that there was a underground organization within the APA that they referred to uh, casually as the Gay PA, which was a network of 
um, homosexual psychiatrists who would would uh, you know interact and share and and you know were connected, interconnected, networked with one another. And he was active in that organization or that that network. Really, it wasn't really a formal organization, but he was really speaking on behalf of this constituency and the broader gay rights movement in general. And you know, uh, you know, encouraged strongly encouraged the APA to retract its definition of homosexuality, and in doing so, uh, provided a real powerful testimony that was was remarkably effective in this broader struggle. And indeed, early in the next year, the board of trustees for the organization met and they retracted the definition and the rest is sort of unfolded as history. And even though that struggle is is, is far from complete, it was a, an important turning point where this figure came out anonymously to perform this, 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 his, his anonymity, his the protection inherent in it was evident in the way that he was acting. His subversive character, uh, his, the subversive character of his statement was evident in his anonymous posture. Um, the way that he was able to stand for an entire group without his personal identity getting in the way of the meaning, without people becoming obsessed with who he was rather than what he was saying. All of that was was able to sort of come through very clearly because he delivered this statement in an anonymous fashion. He performed it as an anonymous actor. And so that case really highlights a lot of these um, elements of anonymous performances that I try to uh, theorize and, and, and get into um, uh, throughout the book. And uh, I think it was a, a strong case to open with and the picture that accompanies that accompanies it, which has in, been in the public circulation for quite a while and appears every now and then, uh, is, is quite striking um, itself. So it was, I really thought it was a powerful case. Yes, I agree. It definitely caught my attention. Um, you mentioned just the definitional thing. You mentioned about anonymity and pseudonymity. Uh, could you just uh, briefly just um, uh, talk about the difference between acting anonymously versus pseudonymously? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's a, it's an important distinction, and at the same time, there are ways where the distinction doesn't matter. Um, so, I, I tr- in some ways, I treat both anonymity, which means acting without any sort of name or without any sort of, you know, um, you know, attempt to personalize oneself versus pseudonymity, which refers to someone who acts with a false name or an avatar or some other symbolic character that can be linked to that actor. Um, both of them involve hiding personal identity. They involve acting with an obscured personal identity and performing some sort of meaning in the world behind a cover of some sort. Both of them involve that level of, of performance that involves hiding personal identity. But the differences are meaningful, and this is very relevant to online uh, activity today, as much as it is relevant to a variety of, of non-digital cases. Because when you act anonymously, you step out of your personal biography. You step out of your personal identity. You cover that so that your actions become divorced from who you are. And when you do that, you sort of step out of the time frame that your personal identity implies. We all have a personal history. We have a personal future. We have an orientation towards our future. Our actions today can have consequences for our lives in the future and our our pasts we carry our pasts with us when we when we have our personal identity out in the open people look at me as Thomas Degloma they they know my past whether as a scholar or as a friend or a family member they know my past and they 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 know that my actions will carry into the future and that I will carry those actions into the future as well. When, when I cover, when anybody covers their personal identity, I'm stepping out of that past. I don't carry that past with me when I'm acting anonymously because I'm divorced from the identity of Thomas DeGloma. And I also don't carry my actions when I act anonymously. I hope to not carry those actions into the future because when I resume the identity of Thomas DeGloma, the way that I acted anonymously is not something that's attached to that person who moves into the future. This applies to all anonymous actors, right? 
The difference with pseudonymity is that when I or anyone else, you know, steps out of their personal identity, they adopt an alternative identity. And that identity can carry its own reputation. It can have its own past and its own future that's still divorced from the personal identity of the individual behind the cover, but it can carry its own reputation. So hypothetically, if I go into an online forum and I use a pseudonym, uh, let's say I adopt the pseudonym like Contemporary Durkheim or Zimmel or something like that, right? The modern, the modern Zimillion or something like that. I, I, I don't, don't look, don't spend time looking for that pseudonym. I'm just thinking out loud here. I've never used it. <laughs> yeah, right. Someone, somebody weird is going to have that pseudonym somewhere, but, but doing, doing weird things. It's not me. I, I'm just thinking out loud here. But if I adopt the pseudonym, the modern Zimillion, and I interacted online with this pseudonym, and I kept that pseudonym in an online forum, over time, that pseudonym would develop its own past and have, and people would be able to predict behavior from that actor based on that pseudonym because there's an identity there. It's just not one's personal identity. It's a, it's a pseudo identity. It's a counter identity, right? So one of the main differences between anonymity and pseudonymity is that pseudonymity allows for the establishment of reputation. It allows for a chain of events to be linked together, actions to be linked together in a way that allows audiences to have some sort of degree of expectation from that actor, some level of predictability about their next move, right? So pseudonymity also allows for certain degrees of accountability. It just doesn't allow for personal accountability. There are, uh, you know, scholars, uh, the philosopher Alfred Moore, for example, is, is one who I, I cite uh, multiple times in the book. Uh, his work is, is, is very amazing in this regard, uh, who argue um, that pseudonymity can allow for uh, accountability and deliberation, public deliberations, online deliberations. We can have accountabilities built into actions with pseudonyms while also protecting individuals from discrimination for their ideas. So, you know, we might, we might conceive of a certain particular issue where people are afraid to speak out publicly because they don't want to have the consequences of their actions and therefore shielding their personal identity would allow for a certain freedom of deliberation that we might find valuable. People can express truths without worrying. They can express their opinions without worrying that, that they will be discriminated against or attacked in the future for carrying those opinions. That becomes problematic when it's a purely anonymous forum, because we also, we also lose the accountability. We also lose the ability to hold people accountable for their actions and their behaviors. Well, we might imagine a middle ground where people use pseudonyms and we can hold them accountable via their pseudonym, but also not, we can also still keep that measure of protection because their personal identity is still obscured. And so, Pseudonyms work in ways that anonyms or anonymity can't work um, because it it does allow for a certain level of narrative identity or recognition in the world without compromising personal identity. And I think that's really the main difference. There's also another level of difference on a performance, a level of performativity, because, you know, pseudonymity is established whenever reputation is established. So it can be a name, like a false name. But it can also be an avatar, a picture, right? It can also be a style, a style of work. Usually when there's a style of work that's associated with a series of street paintings, for example, or a style of work that's associated with a series of murders, for example, the audience will recognize a consistency in the behavior and they'll assign the actor a pseudonym whether or not the actor wants a pseudonym. So if there's an artist out there that's doing political murals and and we can see as the audience that these murals look like they're produced by the same person or the same group of people, typically audiences will assign that person a pseudonym just like we assign serial killers pseudonyms in order to give them some sort of identity that's carried even when we don't know their personal identity. So pseudonyms can take form from the activity whether it's a poet, an artist, a musician, or a murderer, or some other criminal, habitual criminal, or anyone else for that matter, somebody posting, you know, uh, supportive messages online, or somebody posting racist messages online, uh, 
if there's a consistency in the activity, the activity becomes the origin of a pseudonym because we can recognize a continuity of behavior and therefore see a string of actions as being connected to an actor. And that's what pseud- that's what pseudonymity is. Yeah. So in that way, like Banksy, the artist and the um the 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 uh, Boston Strangler or something uh, have something in common that people in society have uh, looked at the bodies of both of these people's work and said, "Hey, we see similarities between one uh, piece of graffiti art and another. Okay, this is made by the same person. You see similar uh, um, intentions, political." Uh, uh, orientation or whatever, and you look at uh, these uh, um, dead people, they seem to have been killed in a similar fashion. Well, maybe they're linked uh, uh, to each other by the person who did the killing, and we're going to give that person, you know, this particular moniker, this particular sort of nickname. Yeah. So in the case of a serial artist or a serial killer, their art and their killing is is continuous through time and pseudonyms carry that quality whereas pure and a purely anonymous act is something that once it's finished will never be connected to another act the same person can act anonymously again but they're not necessarily connected Um, the same person can embody different ways of acting anonymously in the same forum and not be recognized as the same person so anonymity has a, a more of a detached character to it. Right. And how do individuals and communities make use of anonymity for protective reasons? Yeah, that's a, um, a very important dimension uh, of anonymous, um, anonymous activity that I, I discuss with regard to a, a whole wide variety of cases um, and there's really no one answer, but the general point is that acting anonymously or with a pseudonym, but we'll just use anonymous, you know, sort of interchangeably for, for lots of this discussion, acting anonymously can um, protect individuals from the fallout of their action because it divorces actions or comments or expressions or whatever from personal identity that person is protected from the fallout of what they do when their actions are divorced from who they are. Um, so one of the cases I briefly discuss is Saudi women who spoke out against male guardianship laws in Saudi Arabia anonymously on Twitter or when featured in major news outlets like The Guardian or CNN, um, <clears throat> doing so anonymously or when on televised a newscast in the shadows with vocal distortion, much like the way Dr. H. Anonymous disguised himself in that personal event, uh, um, you know, people have done so on, on newscasts in this fashion. And, and that way, Saudi women were able to speak out in a way that they would not have otherwise spoken out. You know, we, we can assume that the anonymity allowed for the freedom of voice that would not otherwise have existed in many cases because they were protected from the very serious fallout of their actions. But there's countless cases in literary history where authors have protected themselves from not just the content of what they were writing in a political sense, although there's many cases where that, you know, that is true, but also um, from reputational damage. It's an interesting thing to think about art and literature in this way. Um, if you write a book and it and everybody hates it, you've kind of ruined your reputation as a writer, or you've created a serious obstacle that you have to overcome now. Now you tell me this after I've already written one book with my name on it. <laughs> the difference is your book is great, man, and I love your book. Um, but if you write it anonymously or with a pseudonym and it flops – you never have to take credit for that. You can start afresh. You've protected yourself from that fallout. The interesting thing with art and literature, though, is that it's kind of like you're hedging your bets because if you write it anonymously or with a pseudonym and it does great, you can be revealed as the author at a later point in time and celebrated and you get the the dual impact of the celebrity at that stage. You get to be celebrated as the author who wrote the brilliant book, 
but you also get to be celebrated as the person who was humble enough to publish it anonymously. Um, and so like charity, when charitable, you know, uh, people who give charitable donations are anonymous and, and they're revealed later, you know, often, you know, you know, by someone else, they're exposed as being the benefactor. Uh, they reap that double reward of being the benefactor and being humble and being humble about it. And, and we think about art and literature as being, and even charity as being more authentic and ethically elevated when it's anonymous. But we only think about those cases of art and literature, which are successful that way. (laughs) Those are the ones that come to light. Imagine that there's been a lot more art and literature that's been produced anonymously that no one knows about. And perhaps no one will ever claim especially that stuff that kind of flopped. No one will ever claim it. Um, And so, you know, a lot of people look at these famous authors who write at some point, write other books under pseudonyms and, and we look at them and the books succeed and we say, Oh wow, they look at this. They, they took the risk and they proved themselves. Well, what if it flopped, we'd never know. They would have never revealed themselves. They would have never, you know, said anything perhaps. So, so uh, you know, that's an interesting strategy that artists can use. Um, other forms of of uh, protection from anonymity come from the way that we use it for confession and therapy, um, the way that we use it in academics uh, and scholarship to protect our subjects from the fallout of what they reveal over the course of our research, um, the way that anonymity is used therapeutically in organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous or other 12-step recovery organizations where anonymity has become a central principle of how people, uh, you know, uh, work to heal or work to transcend what they're suffering in those contexts and the way people use it in a variety of other cases as well. Um, yeah. Uh, just to jump in for a second. Sure. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, like you could, as you're, you're going through, you know, different cases, uh, you know, listeners could note that that there's there's some different dynamics in these different cases. So, like, there's some examples where it's sort of uh, uh, complete or or nearly complete anonymity, where no one or almost no one knows, um, you know, the identity of the person or people involved. But when you're talking about like Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, right? Uh, the anonymity is is it, it's sort of limited, right? Because uh, People outside of the organization or the Alcoholics Anonymous AA meeting, they may not know that their next door neighbor, John, is, you know, alcoholic and and goes to the meetings. But everyone who go who attends the meetings, maybe let's just say the 30 or 40 people that attend the weekly meetings, they all know each other. So it's you know what I mean the the, ident- the identity of individual uh, participant is hidden from outsiders, but there's a sort of inside group that's clued in to all of the members' identities. Absolutely, and what you're pointing to there is a central aspect in my mind of how anonymity is performed. Now there are rare cases of the individual, you know, and, and perhaps this is even exacerbated with computer technology and the digital today because people can act anonymously online with no one else really knowing that they've done that. But in a lot of cases of anonymous action and activity and expression, there is an audience that is unaware of the personal identity, but there are there is a small in-group that is aware. It's a it's a performative dynamic. You're performing for an audience, but there is, as Irving Goffman, the great theorist of performance, of, of personal performance, um, has shown us there is a there is a back region. There is a backstage environment where people are aware, are in the know. And that's true for Banksy. Banksy has a team of people who know who he is. And that's true for the Italian author, Elena Ferrante. She has publishers and probably others who know who, what her personal identity is, what the personal identity of the actor behind the pseudonym is. Um, and, and, and many, many other cases, uh, you know, there is 
a performance for an audience and to that audience, that's where the cover representation shields personal identity, but there's others behind the scenes who actually know. And that's what, that's why when we look at Alcoholics Anonymous and we say, you know, what kind of anonymity is it? Well, it's entirely performative. And the interesting thing is, is that even when individuals might know one another, they still perform the anonymity in a formal sense in those therapeutic environments. And they still ignore one another or act as if they don't know one another if they encounter one another outside of the context of the therapeutic environment in order to, sh- to keep the divorced keep the boundary between the personal identity and the, and the, and the, um, and the alcoholism or the addiction intact. So uh, these people are very much making anonymity come to life with their behaviors, with the way that they talk, with the way that they act, just like Banksy brings his anonymity to life and Elena Ferrante brings her anonymity to life and social movements bring their anonymity to life and so on and so on. It's, it's a very much something that people do and accomplish. Yeah, I'm just reminded, you mentioned early on in our discussion how you were so influenced by the, your um, um, one of your mentors, Eviatar Zerubavel, uh, at, at Rutgers University. And I'm reminded, um, um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Zerubavel's work as well, uh, and he... Um, one of his books, um, in one of his books, he talks about the idea of a conspiracy of silence and how a conspiracy of silence is not simply the absence of you know people talking, but it's sort of an active process that people who are in on it have to do certain things in order to keep the conspiracy alive, you know, and. I'm thinking it's a similar kind of dynamic when we talk about anonymity. It's not just that there aren't people's names there, or they didn't say, you know, their name or, or, or identifying features, uh, but it's actually a, this active process, like you were saying, in the case of Alcoholics Anonymous or in the case of a person who goes to therapy. Well, what happens if you meet your therapist on the street outside of the therapeutic environment? The thing that they're supposed to do is as gracefully as possible, pretend that they don't know you, or at least that they don't know you from the therapy so that you know, they, again, sort of protect the anonymity of the therapeutic relationship, but that this is an active process where potentially a bunch of people are involved in order to maintain this kind of, of um, protection of the person's personal identity. Yeah. And so a distinction I make there, and I try to sort of apply it to the different cases I discuss, is that People who protect themselves, they're able to perform while they're protected, which means they go to meetings and they say a lot of things that they wouldn't say in other environments because they have that shield of anonymity. But they also, not only do they perform while protected, they perform and bring their own protection to life. They perform their own protection. They are the ones who make the anonymity real. And there are consequences to that because going to a therapy meeting and maintaining this culture of anonymity ends up creating a sense that what you're talking about needs to be hidden. The, the, the character of alcoholism and addiction on a cultural level in our contemporary American society, at least, and, and, and lots of other societies as well, the, cult, the predominant cultural view of addiction and recovery is that it's a matter of privacy, anonymity. It's sort of something that is dealt with behind closed doors. And that creates a culture of shame, whether or not we want to do that or not. As a culture, we do that when we end up, you know, sort of treating it this way. And a lot of the generation of the, the, the way that that is generated, or at least an important way that that is generated, is when alcoholics and addicts themselves create the shields that free them. They're also creating the shields that stigmatize them in some ways. And I think you see, and it's not just alcoholics and addicts, by the way, it's it's anybody who uses anonymity for protective purposes. When they act anonym- anonymously, they might be legitimately in need of protection, but they're also reinforcing the notion that they have to hide, right? And in doing that, um, they might there might be some un uh, 
planned consequences to that type of activity. And in the case of alcoholics and um, addicts, there's a number of people in recent years, the last decade, decade and a half, especially who have sort of come out, so to speak, um, as addicts uh, publicly as a way of sort of confronting that shame, confronting that notion that we have to hide. Um, And others like um, Channel Miller, who was the victim of the very publicized uh, rape case at Stanford University. And and she was sort of given a pseudonym throughout the court hearings and in all of the official documents and was anonymous in the press and et cetera, at some point released a victim statement in her own personal name and, and writes about how freeing it was because when she was anonymized through the process, she felt like she had no ability to tell her story. And when she claimed her name and claimed her experiences, she was able to transcend it on another level. So the anonymity in those court cases, while providing a measure of protection, <clears throat> also creates a very isolating, socially isolating situation that can lead to shame, that can lead to an exacerbation of the the sort of loneliness involved with, with many of these struggles. Right. And what is subversive anonymity? So subversive anonymity, and again, these are analytic brackets that I create for the sake of talking about these characteristics. A lot of the cases I discuss have elements of different you know, uh, characteristics. But when I talk about the subversive character of anonymity, I talk about the ways that individuals use anonymity and pseudonymity to subvert social norms. But these social norms can be le- laws, they can be legal you know, codes, they can also be you know, more general social norms and values that are that are sort of the, the mainstream um, norms and values. And when people act anonymously, they because they escape accountability, they are able to do and say things that they would otherwise never say and do. Um, they're able to meet together with other people who are also doing and saying those things, who if they were doing and saying those things in their personal communities and with their personal identity exposed, they would be ostracized, persecuted, shamed, whatever the case might be. And there are, and this is one of the great contradictions of anonymity, is that good or bad? No, it's not either, right? It's neither good nor bad. It is. It depends on the case and your assessment of it, because individuals can use anonymity to subvert oppressive norms. They can use it subversively like the street artist Black Hand to challenge state censorship and persecution in Iran by creating street art that is critical of state power, right? And we might say, hypothetically, wow, that's inspirational. That's a positive way of using anonymity to critique an oppressive or repressive power. Some people might say that. There's also a big community of people who would not say that. They would say that it's villainous, that it's treasonous, that it's treacherous, that it's blasphemous, right? So again, depending on the audience in your position within it, one person's positive subversion can be another person's debauchery, right? Or another person's uh, oppressive subversion. But we also can look at today, we can look at the ways that the Ku Klux Klan used anonymity in subversive ways. Now, some people today might be tempted to say, oh, the Klan wasn't subversive. They were reinforcing the sort of dominant norms of racism. And that is true, that they were reinforcing some very established racist norms when they were acting, but the Klan didn't exist before the end of the Civil War. There was no Ku Klux Klan in the antebellum South. The Ku Klux Klan existed after the Confederacy was defeated. When there was a national imposition of a Northern perspective on slavery, which is to say that it was abolished, right? There was a national imposition of Northern laws and values. Then that Confederate pro-slavery attitude and actions became something that was forced underground or forced to retreat out of the dominant and into the subordinate, right? And then you see the rise of anonymous clan activity. Then you see ex-Confederate soldiers and racists of the South putting on hoods and masks and various types of disguises to 
act racism out in a subversive way to attack the dominant order imposed by the North in the aftermath of the Civil War. So they are subverting these dominant Northern norms and they're using anonymity to do so. But it's certainly in a way that we would say today, you know, hopefully everyone, of course, everyone wouldn't say this, but but that all, you know, freedom loving people would say today is, 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 uh, tyrannical is is um, terroristic, um, but it was nevertheless subversive. So in some cases, we look at subversive anonymity and we say that is very powerful and inspirational. In other ways, we look at subversive anonymity and we say that is terrifying. Um, but the the thing that ties these cases together is that to look at how individuals and groups use anonymity to undermine dominant or mainstream values, norms of behavior and norms of expression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Really so much to think about. Um, let's, uh, let me ask you something else. Uh, what is the difference between self typification and other typification and what are some real world examples of these behaviors? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, this is, a uh, another type of anonymity, perhaps one of the most abstract concepts and ideas I discuss in the book. Um, But the argument here stems from the work of Alfred Schutz, the great philosopher, phenomenologist, social theorist, who's embraced by uh, sociology and and other disciplines as well, but also is inherent in the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, is seen in the work of Zimmel, the classical sociological theorist, in others. And it's rooted in this argument that when we see individuals as a type of person or as a categorical label, we are blind to their personal identities. And this is a form of anonymity. It's not the clearest, most evident form, but it serves as a form of anonymity because it renders us blind to personal identity. So, in a relatively mundane, relatable case, when we refer to a person as the waiter and we say, oh, you know, there's the waiter, there's your waiter, right? They might be wearing a name tag. Their their employment records are certainly there. They're not hiding themselves, but in their interactions with us, they're anonymous because they're a type and not a person, right? Can we easily identify them? Sure. But when we go home and tell a story about eating a meal at a restaurant, will we identify them? No. We'll say, and then the waiter brought the breadsticks. We're not going to say, and then Dan or Sue brought the breadsticks. We're going to say, and then the waiter brought them. And so they remain. And, you know, even police officers have badge numbers and they have license plates on their cars and their personal, I mean, I'm sorry, they're public servants. So their their names are, are often a matter of public record. But you get pulled over and you get a speeding ticket. You go home and say, some cop pulled me over. We don't care who it is, right? And so in the phenomenon of the interaction, there is a social anonymity that's created that shapes the way that we think about others in our lives. So we anonymize others, and this is a form of other typification when we refer to them as the waiter or when we refer to them as the nurse or when we refer to, in in some ways, you know, um, you know, more politically charged and, and a lot of more politically charged and, and, and in some ways, in some cases, problematic senses when we use categories uh, to group large people, large groups of people together as being the same type of person, right? And this is done throughout history in deeply problematic ways. We're anonymizing the individuals involved. And that's, those are all forms of other typification. Self-typification comes from the fact that when we do this, we often type ourselves or a group of quote unquote us together as an antithesis, an antithetical type. So for example, when we treat the waiter as the waiter, we are acting as the client, as the diner, as the eater of the establishment, right? When we, when nations go to war against a foreign enemy in the United States there's there's a number of 
of very uh, deeply disturbing examples of this, they will typify that enemy as a villain in some ways, often using racism, often using various tropes and labels to <clears throat> to vilify their enemies and demoralize and demoralize them, but also dehumanize them in the minds of Americans, while Americans are often deemed, the American GIs are often deemed the us, the hero, the valiant, right? So self forms of self-typification often complement other typification in these relationships. But we can also typify ourselves when we use labels to refer to ourselves. For example, when we say, you know, doctors do this all the time when they lead with their titles or, you know, um, they want to be seen as the doctor before the individual. Um, you know, when we typify ourselves by, you know, foregrounding our categorical labels or our professions or whatever it might exist in order to be seen as a member of that class more than an individual. Um, we engage in forms of self-typification, but often self and other typification are complementary in the sense that when we typify others, we inherently typify ourselves. And so these are relational dynamics that end up defining certain social situations by virtue of types rather than people. The individual personal identities are are rendered irrelevant in many ways. And there's there's several ways that I, you know, discuss this in the chapter, but you know, um I think w- one of the most well, they're all they're all interesting, and they're all politically or morally charged in various ways. Um, but one example would be with anonymous sex. Um, there's various forms of anonymous sexual encounters that exist in the world today, where people's personal identities are rendered irrelevant to the encounter, and either a pseudonym or no name whatsoever. Uh, is is relevant is is a part of the encounter and when we think about digital interactions around sex and pornography for example those types of interactions are often well the the person who is quote unquote consuming the pornography is typically anonymous in the exchange i mean there are there are other examples where they're not uh, or where they use pseudonyms but we can think of them as anonymous behind a computer screen in the pri- privacy of their own homes. And the the subjects of the pornography on the screen are anonymized, not because their faces aren't visible, but because nobody cares about their names or they might use a pseudonym and they are being viewed as a type. They're being viewed as whatever type the person desires, right? And so that is why they're being viewed and that is why the interaction happens. That's why the, that's the character of that sexuality in that regard. Um, so it is one that is almost entirely anonymized, but yet is, uh, you know, uh, quite common is it is uh, pervasive in, in our world today. Uh, I think it's one of the largest industries <laughs> today. You know, so it's not something that where we say, oh, anonymous sex, that rarely happens because we typically associate sex and sexuality with intimacy when we're thinking about romance and, and partnerships. And when we partner with somebody, we are, it is very much based on their personal identity and, and our attraction to them and their, their attraction to us. But uh, there are many different examples of, of anonymous and pseudonymous sex out there where people are defined as types and not individuals or types and not personal identities. Right, right. Well, there's clearly so much uh, to think about your book and the issue of anonymity uh, in our society. We're going to run out of time in a moment. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, ask you one final question. Um, given the, the kind of range of phenomena that you look at and the, the just tremendous amount of, of different cases and different kinds of cases, I'm curious, what do you hope readers take away from your book? Well, I hope there's a couple of answers to that question, but I hope that there's a broader understanding of how social how socially prevalent but also how socially accomplished anonymity is how anonymity requires a performance and an activity a dynamic between actor or actors and audience and that is an inherently social phenomenon and 
that understanding of anonymity and pseudonymity, I think, can help us to interpret a lot of different cases that are relevant to the world today, from political intrigue, anonymous authorship, anonymous accusations in the media, um, uh, digital interactions, and, and, a, and a lot more. So I hope that sociological understanding of anonymity and pseudonymity, which I try to develop throughout the book, is the core takeaway point. What does sociology have to offer to this understanding? Well, the answer is that there's a lot, right? So Soci- we need sociology to understand it. But the second is that there's a lot, as you pointed out in your opening to our conversation, there are a lot of cases, historically and contemporary cases, that I delve into quite deeply. Um, I try to do some deep dives into these cases, and I think there's a lot to learn from each of those particular cases, whether it's the anonymity of the medical professionals who participate in capital punishment and, and executions by lethal injection, or the anonymity of bank personnel behind the financial crises, or the anonymity of social movement actors who wear different masks, or the anonymity of artists and authors and why they're actually acting anonymously, or any of the other cases that we've discussed today. A sociological perspective on anonymity can help us to understand the particular dynamics of those cases. And so while I could have written a thinner book focusing just on the general theoretical points, and there would have been some value there, I chose to do a lot of deep diving here into these cases because I started to see how powerful the sociological perspective was when it came to interpreting those cases and how it gave us insight that I think was lacking before. So I hope on a general level and on a particular level that there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot to offer. Yes. Well, we're all glad that you wrote the book that you did. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. That concludes our program. Thanks for listening and have a great day.